In this series of videos I'm attempting to repair this Electronica D3 calculator. It's a Russian design calculator built back in the 1970s and in the first video in this series I just dismantled the unit and um, on visual inspection found some capacitors on the supply that appeared to be losing their contents. I um, haven't really cleaned this yet, um, we're just uh, carrying on from where we left off in the previous video. Now just to clarify um, what this is, now in the first video I said uh, these were TTL devices and they're actually not, they're a kind of a halfway house between the DTL discrete circuits we saw in the Toshiba calculator and what we'd now term true TTL components. Uh, so these are MOS devices. They kind of fulfill very similar roles to the TTL devices in that there's a whole family of them and they fulfill lots of different functions, digital flip-flops, gates, that sort of thing. But they are MOS technology and if you're familiar with MOS technology of that era then you'll know that the power supply voltages can be a bit unusual. Now, looking at the types of devices we have on these boards, um, what I'm expecting to find is a power supply that is at around minus 27 volts, which might sound a bit strange, but that's what these devices typically were specified at. Uh, and again, this uses negative logic in a very similar way to the Toshiba. So this is really uh, very uh, analogous to the Toshiba in terms of its functionality, the way the circuits work um, from the um, PCB perspective. But the actual devices used are, of course, very different. So the voltages I would expect to find on the power supply, there's no markings on the supply that I can make any sense of, um, but I would expect to find something around the minus 27 volts something in between 0 and minus 27 so that gives us our kind of intermediate voltage that we saw in the schematic I showed for the uh, Toshiba uh, and of course a higher voltage for the Nixie tubes. These are fairly small Nixie tubes so I'm guessing something around the 90 to 100 volts. Um, maybe lower, they are a bit dim so um, they might be the under, uh, being underrun uh, but we'll find out, uh, we'll power this up. I don't want to leave it on too long um, because I don't want the capacitors self-destructing. I did leave it on for a couple of minutes and looked at it through the thermal camera. Nothing seems to be getting hot so I've got a feeling the capacitors are actually open circuit but I don't want to push my luck too far so we'll be fairly brief with this testing. Uh, all the cards are out so the supply voltages won't be quite right but this does appear to have proper regulation uh, or at least uh, degree of regulation so I think the voltages will still be somewhere fairly close. There are four um, pins that appear to go to the power supply connector on the card rack so I've got the uh, multimeter reference to what seems to be the ground pin so we'll measure the other three I'll turn it on Hopefully you can see that we're getting around minus 14 volts, so I'm suspecting that's the intermediate voltage. Minus 25, I would have expected something a bit higher than that, maybe minus 26, 27, but um, I'm assuming these are adjustable with these pots, or it might be that um, obviously it's too low because the capacitors are failing. Um, but having said that, uh, there is no load on this at the moment, so that's more likely to go down than up. And then finally we have 73 volts. Again, that seems a bit on the low side. So what I'll do is I'll switch the meter into AC mode. There's no load, so um, I'm not expecting to see a lot of AC ripple, but we'll see if there's any at all. Uh, not too much. This is on the minus 27 volt, and there's quite a lot of ripple on that line. And again quite a lot of ripple on that line as well so I'll turn it back off I'm not going to push my lock any further than that so the next thing I'm going to do is replace the uh, capacitors on this board um, 
there aren't that many on here. There's, there's actually only six capacitors on this. And so what I'm going to do, in fact, there's um, eight, but two of those are filter capacitors uh, across the uh, transformer windings. Um, it's just these large electrolytic I'm going to change to start with. And uh, then we'll put the board back in and uh, see if that improves things at all. Um, if we get nice stable supplies after that, what I'll probably try doing is refitting the boards and see if that makes any difference. Uh, these circuits, if there's a lot of AC on the um, power supply rails, then it is of course going to upset these. Now one question I got in the uh, previous video was, are there any decoupling caps on these? Um, well, I think the question was based on the fact I said these were TTL and because of the nature of these devices. It doesn't really need decoupling caps on the board, uh, but if I need to make modifications to get this working, I may need to add some, but so uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So next job is to get these capacitors replaced. I've replaced all the capacitors on the supply board. I've used much higher voltage ones than really I would need to, just to keep the relative sizes looking kind of period correct. I want to keep it looking uh, reasonable. So uh, the big green one actually reads OK. It's supposed to be 200 microfarads and it is. That one reads fine. Uh, I've changed it anyway because um, if the rest have failed, then almost certainly this won't be far behind. Another one, uh, this one actually reads OK as well. So this one's supposed to be a 100 microfarad capacitor. Actually reads 126. This one reads open circuits, it's not uh, giving anything at all, so that one's completely dead. This one reads open circuit as well, so this is one where uh, the bottom had popped out. And the final one only has one lead. Uh, I didn't break that off when I was taking it out, that's just um, what it was like in the board. When I touched it, it just rocked about. The lead was still soldered to the board, but at some point it's corroded through and just snapped off. So. That, of course, will have been doing nothing. So the next thing is uh, we'll power it back up, see what the supply voltages are and if they've changed at all. So it's powered up. Look at the first one. About the same, but it seems a lot more stable. And the same there. And that's quite a bit higher. I think it was about 72 volts before. So that's risen quite a bit. So what I'm going to do now is pop the boards back in and see if it's made any difference to the operation of the calculator. I've put all the boards back into the calculator. I'll try powering it back up and see what happens. OK, well clearly it's still not working properly, although we do now have another character. We've just got one missing at the end now and we'll see if any of the keys work. Before, um, the only key that had any impact was the um, multiplication key. And it's doing the same thing it was before. So we'll try a few other keys. Okay, that's new, it wasn't doing that before. Okay, we now have got the minus sign lighting up when I hit the minus key. Uh, none of the numeric keys work. Clearly it's doing something because it's responding not just to key presses but to a sequence. Okay, well it's doing far more than it was but it's still not working as it should. The uh, last thing I'm going to do in this uh, video is to measure the supply voltages again and see if there's still something reasonable. Uh, as I said, the, uh, con the uh, power supply does seem to have uh, regulation built into it, so I'm suspecting that uh, the voltages should not have changed too much. So we'll try the Nixie tube supply first, 88 volts. That seems fairly reasonable for that size tube. Minus about 26 volts, it's a bit on the low side. But um, I think these devices have a 10% supply tolerance, so it's still well within what uh, should be operational. And then trying to avoid blowing it up. 
minus 12, which seems quite a sensible value. It seems to be a, a normal value, so to speak. Uh, OK, so what I need to do is start uh, fault finding and we'll go through the normal process that I take. So I'm going to try and figure out what each of the boards does. It's going to be more tricky with this machine because I don't have the spec sheets for the individual components. So it's going to be, uh, I think, a lot of head scratching figuring out what uh, each part does. And the way I will probably go about this is to see what signals change in response to key presses. Now, in particular, um, what's interesting here is we've got uh, more than one decimal point illuminated. And if I change the decimal point setting, it doesn't seem to have any impact. So that's probably where I'll start, is trying to figure out why um, all the decimal points, or at least the number of decimal points, are illuminated. It's interesting that six decimal points are illuminated and the machine supports up to six decimal places, so there's obviously some correlation there. And as I said, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to trace back through uh, from the decimal point pin on the Nixie tube to the particular circuit that's supposed to control it, and then work my way back from there and try and figure out why it's showing all six decimal points at the same time. I'll also look into why none of the numeric keys work. Um, again, this is kind of a state machine arrangement where uh, there should be a latch for each of the keys that's going to be pressed, and then that should latch some data into a data register somewhere. So I'll need to track all that down and um, see what we can find. It's about 10 minutes later and before I finish this video I thought I'd just show the first part of the fault finding process uh, in case you find it interesting. The design of machines like this is normally fairly modular, that is each board is, is most likely to fulfil um, fairly simple functions. There's not that many components on each board, especially these five at the front. So um, what I'm going to do is start popping these boards out and see if it makes any difference to the operation of the machine. I won't do all of them, um, you'll probably find that fairly boring, but um, it's usually fairly informative. If we can take a board out that um, makes the machine do exactly the same thing, in other words, the fault's still exactly the same, then it's a very good place to start our fault finding process. And when we start tracing back from the, um, the parts of the machine that do appear to be working, uh, we can start looking into the board that uh, seems most likely to be causing the problem. There's no guarantee that particular board is the one causing the fault because it might be used by other parts of the system. But it's a good way of trying to identify if a particular board has any uh, impact on the nature of the fault. So we'll start off, we'll take out the first board. So I've got the first board out, we'll try powering this up. And now we're getting nothing on the display at all, apart from the decimal points. So it seems fairly likely this board is working at least to a degree um, because it's completely changed the operation of the machine. As I say, it's no, no guarantee, but it's a good starting point. We'll pop the next board out. And what we're looking for is, uh, when we take a board out, that it makes absolutely no difference. All of these uh, circuits are required uh, even for the basic operation of the machine. I don't think any of these are ever going to be idle. Uh, so we'll power this back up. It looks the same. And it's actually doing exactly the same thing with that board removed as it does with it fitted. Minus sign comes on. OK, so that's interesting. So this is board two, and um, I may well start fault finding by looking at this. I'm just going to pop the other three out and see if um, any of them make any difference. And uh, if they do, get back on camera and uh, just let you know what I found. OK, well, interestingly, I found that um, Removing board two, you could see what happened. It made absolutely no difference to the nature of the fault. And when I take out board four, uh, what I get 
is this, so I'll turn the power on and we're now getting a digit showing other than zero. Not only that, but if I press a key uh, you can see that the value changes for all the digits. So um, there's obviously something not working the way it should, but again board 4 would seem to be a good place to start because it seems to have some uh, impact on data being put into the data register. So um, that's the first steps I normally take. This, As I say, they're normally fairly modular, so uh, when we have absolutely no information on it at all and where the boards are going to be quite hard to deal with because we don't have any data sheets for any of the components, then this is kind of a good way of trying to narrow down uh, where we should be looking. Uh, just power it back up and make sure it still does the same thing. And again, quite interestingly there, it cleared itself when we powered it up. So it's working to a certain extent. Uh, we can be fairly confident the clock's running uh, partly because it's scanning the um, uh, display. It's very unlikely that it's, uh, it's displaying all these statically. Uh, so I'm just going to carry on working my way through this and in the next video we'll start looking into the uh, repair in a bit more detail and hope we can make some progress. Um, incidentally, it might not be coming across on the camera, but uh, since we uh, replaced the caps in the power supply, the display is much brighter and it's more consistent across all the, um, the digits. So I've got one up here not working. I don't know if that's the driver or if it's just blanked. It, um, it might just be uh, part of the nature of the fault. Uh, but what um, I'll be looking at, and this is again a kind of uh, indicative of potential issues with machines like this. As I said in the repair for the Toshiba, it works on all the digits in order. So if this digit's not working, it might just be completely stopping when it gets to the first digit, and that what might be what's stopping it from running. So it could just be as simple as the um, that particular digit bit is stuck. So again, I'll be tracing that back through, uh, going back from the driver board, finding out uh, where it's controlled from, and uh, see if there's anything stopping that digit from being uh, acted on or, or accessed. So uh, fairly consistent way of working, and hopefully it's making some sense, and um, it will be nice to get this unit working.